Let us treat you to a vintage episode of my previous podcast, We Knew the Moon, featuring Rhonda as a co-host. Top up your spooky meter until we come back soon with a new season. Welcome to the Switchblade Sisters Social Club, a true crime podcast where two sisters exploit their worst fears for your entertainment. You're welcome. I'm Dee. And I'm Rhonda, and together we are the Sake Sisters. For more information, check out our website at www.switchbladesisterssocialclub.com or find us on Instagram and Facebook at Switchblade Sisters Social Club. Thanks for listening. Hi everyone, this is Dee and this is Weena the Moon. And today I've got my sister back on. Hello, Ron. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> we had such fun. My sister, if um, you didn't have a listen to the cults episode, do. What's wrong with you? Um, she is a copy editor and social media manager. And I will get her to say her website link in a moment. But yeah, you can find the links in the show notes. Why don't you say where we can find you on social media and on the internet? So my website is randasafier.com. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook, LinkedIn, and on YouTube. All right. So today, why don't you tell us your topic? <clears throat> so today, following on from our episode on cults, today I'm going to talk about psychics. Oh, mm-hmm. um, okay. So can I just off the bat, I'm going to tell you my opinion yes. on psychics and then, and you do the same. And then let's see if at the end, my opinion has changed. Okay, let's go. My opinion of psychic psychics is that I really just don't know. Uh-huh. I don't know. Uh-huh. Like I a hundred percent think there's so many fakes out there and so many manipulative people. Yeah. I also think there's a lot of super intuitive people that, you know, maybe they're not psychic, but they pick up on body language and energy in a way that others don't. So whether you want to call that psychic, I don't know. But do I think there's people that actually communicate? with spirits that have passed I still really don't know but then I'm sure you're going to talk about our favorite yep psychic, our guy our guy right? Glenn yep Glenn Miles I'll put mm-hmm. his details in the show notes as well um he's come into our lives recently and although I don't know whether I believe it or not he tells us stuff and I think how the fuck else would he know that yep, yep. and you feel great after speaking to him and he is spot on about a lot of things that can't be explained as a GDPR breach, you know? Right, exactly. And we've we've analyzed between us, haven't we? Because like a lot of the stuff that he tells us in our sessions are kind of apply to both of us if it's about our grandparents, uh-huh, we have uh-huh. the same ones and so forth. And we've consulted with our parents because there's a lot of stuff that we also don't know because we don't know those family members uh-huh, that he's referring uh-huh. to. Great aunts and uncles and even our grandparents, a couple of them in particular, we didn't know that well or uh-huh. died before we were born. And they've confirmed what he said. And it's like, yep. shit is not on our Facebook. Well, and the other thing is also what makes it kind of more believable is that we're obviously not from here. So a lot of our family records, medical records of family members, that's all abroad. And probably not even abroad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I doubt that any of this stuff exists anywhere. Yeah. There's just no way he could have accessed that sort of information, you know, down to causes of death and names they used to call us, things like that. That's not on the internet. The one thing that he said in our first session that freaked Uh me the fuck out. Uh I had just got back from York from visiting my friend Isla, who moved to York recently. Isla does have a Facebook account, but she never uses it. So we are Facebook friends, but there's no interaction between us on Facebook because I never tag her on anything. She's not on there. You know what I mean? I'm not one to post my location on Facebook because I'm paranoid. Uh So there's no record on Facebook of me going to York. So basically, during our session, he said that one of the spirits that he was communicating with said, you had fun with Isla. And I had literally got back from York Uh visiting Isla the day before. And I was just like, short of hacking my bank account details. Yeah. There's no way he could have known. Find out I was in York, let alone with someone who's got quite an irregular name in England, Isla. There's loads of stuff that when you go see a psychic that they say that you're like, okay, yeah, you, that's a safe bet. Yeah, yeah. Even and, and I'm going to talk oh, about that. The long and the short of it is I just don't know. I just don't know whether I believe it or not. Yeah. 
I mean, we can't deny a lot of the stuff was so spot on. I would say there was some generic things in there as well, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about. But then, you know, there's certain things that do that can apply to a lot of people. And so it's easy to sort of say, you know, be suspicious and say, oh, that's generic. That can apply to everyone. But you know, it kind of did. And yeah, not everything is going to be so specific. Yeah. <laughs> even if it was 100% true, not everything's going to be so specific that it only applies to you and couldn't possibly apply to anyone else. Yeah. And I'm going to get back on to Glenn. Love um, you, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Oh, yeah. We love Glenn. We, <laughs> we love Glenn. We, you know, there's so many times <laughs> I discovered Glenn in January. And there's been so many times where I'm thinking, oh, what would Glenn say? What would Glenn say about this? <laughs> or I'm like, oh. <laughs> Do you know what I need? I need a bit of Glenn. Yeah. For your listeners, find them on Instagram and Facebook. You will not regret it. Okay. So can I tell you about psychics? Yes. Carry on with the Glenn show. <laughs> I'm going to start with talking about what is a psychic. So according to Wikipedia, a psychic is a person who claims to use extrasensory perception to identify information hidden from the normal senses, particularly involving telepathy or clairvoyance or who performs acts that are apparently inexplicable by natural laws. The scientific consensus is that there's no proof of the existence of such powers, and it describes the practice as pseudoscience. And I'm oh, a bit sciencey. <laughs> it's got science oh, no, in that's there. quasi science. <laughs> so basically, the word psychic doesn't automatically mean ghosts and spirits talking to ghosts and spirits. It could also be people that read minds yeah. or read energy. Okay, cool. Yeah. That- That's interesting. In 1988, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences gave a report on the subject and concluded that there is no scientific justification from research conducted over a period of 130 years for the existence of parapsychological phenomena. A lot of things from the 80s have been disproven. Yeah. The world has come a long way since the 80s, even though it feels like for us five minutes ago, but the world's Mm -hmm. come a long way. You know, the 80s, five years ago. They're saying no scientific justification. So our interest could stop right there. <laughs> and but, yet. <laughs> but let's not let the facts get in the way of our curiosity. Mm-hmm. A bit of history about psychics. So by the late 20th century, psychics were commonly associated with New Age culture. And psychic readings and advertising for psychics was very common from the 1960s onwards. And readings were offered for a fee and given in settings such as over the phone in homes or at psychic fairs. So in this podcast episode, I'm going to focus on three things. Former U.S. First Lady Nancy Reagan and her relationship with her astrologer slash psychic. Cool. Whose name was Joan Quigley. I'm going to talk about celebrity psychic Sally Morgan. And lastly, TV trickster Darren Brown for a balanced perspective. Because let it not be said that we are not balanced. I mean, I'm totally unbalanced and I'm okay with that, but go ahead. I'm normally sciencey. You know, I'm an, mm-hmm. I'm a non-religious person. I normally believe in science. I remember, and I think this is important to actually add here. It was back in November. Deanna told me that she spoke to a psychic and I was like, what? Why? Like, if you need answers to questions, that's not where I would go. I would want concrete answers, you know? I'm beginning to now see the value in not having concrete answers. But that's a whole separate topic. And the older I get, the less black and white I get, the more open-minded I get, and the more I realize that actually we don't have answers to everything. A lot of things that fall into this category of spiritual or even occult, it's stuff that science just hasn't been able to explain yet. Yep. There's a lot of things that were counted as spiritual, religious, and so forth that we now explain with science as we've learned more. And I think still people question psychics and spirituality more than they question religious beliefs. And to me, it's kind of all the same. And I've begun to understand the importance of faith, you know, having Mm -hmm. faith in something maybe that's bigger than you that you can explain, maybe just to make you feel better. So that's where I lie. You know, I don't know that it's true. I don't know that it's not true. But if something makes you feel better and it's not harmful, then I don't see the harm. Yeah. So let's talk about Nancy Reagan. <sighs> so Nancy Reagan, she was the former first lady. She was President Ronald Reagan's wife. He was the 40th president of the USA. He was a Republican. Now, let me just add. That we don't like him. <laughs> we are not endorsing the Republican Party here. Not one bit. <laughs> I can relate to Nancy. I like her, you know. Let me tell you about Nancy. 
So Nancy was known to be Ronald's fierce protector and perhaps his closest advisor. And she took a real decisive role in his decision-making. Decisive, but as we will find out, also divisive. So, (laughs) oh yes. She was also known for using an astrologer slash psychic whose name was Joan Quigley. We'll call her Joan. So Nancy met Joan in the 70s when they both appeared on a show called, a talk show called The Merv Griffin Show. Can I, wait, wait, wait. I just want to Google a picture of uh, Joan. Joan? Oh, Joan. She looks like what you Because I like to have like. visuals. Oh, I love a visual. Oh. Joan? Joan looks like what you think Joan looks like. Oh, my God. She does. Oh, my God. Do you know what she looks like? Who? She looks like Murder, She Wrote. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so if you need an idea of what Joan quickly looks like, I'll post in the socials. But Angela Lansbury would play her in the film about this. So Joan, she was actually a wealthy socialite. And so unfortunately, Ronald had an assassination attempt on his life and was shot on March 30th, 1981. A few days later, a distraught Nancy asked Joan if the attack could have been prevented if her husband's birth chart had been consulted. When Joan said yes, Nancy immediately got her on the payroll because Nancy was in a high state of stress, panic, anxiety. Even if you're not a believer in this sort of thing, can you imagine if your husband almost got killed? Yeah. You'd be desperate, wouldn't you? And even if you were like, well, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm not going to take any chances and I can fucking afford to pay for it. You would, wouldn't you? Probably, possibly. and And she did. Joan agreed to give Nancy regular readings on her husband's future for a price of $3,000 per month on a retainer. So that would be considerably more than the 3000 equivalent equivalent in money. Oh, today. yeah. So Joan was well paid. So this began the most closely guarded secret of the Reagan White House. Ronald was shot just 10 weeks into his presidency. And Ronald had a good sense of humor about about this. And he later joked with Nancy and said, honey, I forgot to duck. (laughs) That's actually actually endeared him to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I like that about him. I like that about him, too. So he said that to her. But the shooting almost cost him his life. And after three hours of surgery, the doctors removed the bullet, which was lodged in his lung one inch from the heart. So he was lucky. Wow. The gunman was caught immediately, and 12 days after he was shot, Ronald returned to the White House. But the near-death experience changed him. But, you know, he returned 12 days after being shot. Like, that's a serious serious work ethic. I've had, like, more time off than that for gastroenteritis. (laughs) I mean, that's, yeah, that's impressive. So he had some tenacity. But the shooting, shooting made him more convinced than ever that there was a purpose at work in his presidency, but it had the opposite effect on Nancy. She was left with a paralyzing fear of another attack on her husband. In 1981, Nancy said, I thought for a while it was something that in time would fade away, and it hasn't. It's a particular kind of trauma that never leaves you once you've known it. That endeared me to Nancy. You yeah, know? it's one of your worst nightmares, isn't it? Yeah. Your partner. And- and constantly living in a state of anxiety like that, I can imagine. And the longer he's in presidency, the more chance yeah. of it happening again. And U.S. presidents didn't have much luck no. with that. Well, there was a history of assassinations on U.S. presidents, so I can see yeah. you know, her fear was tangible. In Nancy's memoir, a book called My Turn, she reveals that she told Joan, I'm scared every time he leaves the house. So she sought advice from Nancy on the timings of all of Ronald's comings and goings. So Joan later said that over the next seven years, she gave guidance that went far beyond mundane scheduling to matters of diplomacy, Cold War politics, and even the timing of the president's cancer surgery and more. I'm going to get onto it. So she apparently was really influential within the White House. And it really makes you think in that era, God, how many of those decisions did Joan make? You know, what was Ronald and what was Joan? Should Joan have been the president? Right. <laughs> I, I also feel for Nancy because I would love to outsource my uh, decision making. Oh my God, making. decision making. Yes. <laughs> I think that's one of the appeals of things like astrology as yeah. well, is when you're like, well, well it's well, definitely don't. like, oh, not my fault, I'm yeah. an Aries, then you don't I'm have a to, dick. <laughs> you don't have to second guess your decisions. Also, yeah. it's tiresome. It's tiresome. It's a tiresome business making decisions. 
so, you know, I can see also why people would delegate decisions, you know, to somebody else, if, you know, everyday decisions, like what's everyone going to eat? What's everyone going to wear? What are we going to do this weekend? So Nancy had some help with that. Nancy, however, downplayed Joan's influence when the news that Reagan had an astrologer and a psychic was met with criticism and mocking. This was controversial. Nancy was embarrassed about the news being out and said, while astrology was a factor in determining Ronald's schedule, it was not the only one. So she admits it was a factor in his schedule, but no political decision was ever based on it. She claims... I don't know if I believe that because Joan says the contrary, but who knows what's true. Joan yeah. says she was very influential and made decisions even relating to the Cold War. So there was a debate over exactly how much influence Joan actually had. She claimed to have a bigger role. And in her book, she had a book in 1990 called What Does Joan Say? My Seven Years as White House <laughs> Astrologer to Nancy and Ron. We just said that we think about, you know, what, is, what would Glenn say? <laughs> <laughs> hey, now let's buy John's book. Let's see what she says. I mean, it is in her best interest to claim she had as much influence. Yeah, of course. Possible, obviously. Yeah. And it's also in Nancy's interest to claim that she didn't. Yeah. So who knows? Who knows? It's so, probably a mixture of both, right? Yeah. So Joan said she was responsible for the timings of all press conferences, as well as most speeches, the State of the Union addresses, and even the takeoffs and landings of Air Force One. Now, obviously, if you were paying a psychic or an astrologer to make decisions, those are big ones. I'm less perturbed by the decisions she helped to make that have really mainly affect just the president. And yeah, staff. I'm more disturbed by about the, the political ones, the diplomacy yeah, ones. about affecting policy changes and whatnot. Yeah. Like, you know, do I really care what time the press conference was held? No. Yeah. Or what time the plane took off and landed? No. When you say that she influenced the Cold War? That's yeah, that's, get, that's getting shit. heavy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> However, Joan only spoke to the president once briefly at a 1985 state dinner. But in 1990, she said, through Nancy, I really had a direct line to the president. So her dealings with the president directly were really only on one occasion. I it was all that was on purpose. Oh, why'd you say that? Because to limit the contact so that it was less known how influential this astrologer was. Okay. Okay. Do you think Nancy is already conscious of the fact that it didn't, it wasn't a good look. She, they were already getting a bit of criticism for it by the sounds of it. So I'm sure yeah. it was on purpose that they kept them as separate as possible. Yeah. Nancy gave Joan the president's proposed schedules, which is a major security breach. And Joan designated good and bad days for travel and public events. They used to run Ronald's schedule past Joan first. In Nancy's memoir, she wrote, the arrangement began as a crutch, but within a year or two, it had become a habit. So it sounds like Joan kind of became more and more influential this time Wait, around. So that's Nancy admitting it was a crutch and then a habit? Yeah, Nancy admitted that she used Joan's help as a crutch at first after the assassination attempt, but within a year or two, became a habit. Normal, just normal that's life. That's a very positive way to describe it. Does she regret it? Or is she uh, to I would say she, to protect herself from criticism? I would say from what I've read, she regrets that it was exposed. But I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about what okay. she said afterwards, because that actually makes me quite sad for Nancy. So initially, Nancy kept all of this from Ronald. So it was actually just an arrangement between Nancy and Joan at first. But in the end, you know, Ronald indulged her. He was known to really dote on his wife. And he said, if it makes you feel better, go ahead and do it. But it might look a little odd if it ever came out. And it did. The White House tried to brush off the controversy when it was exposed by the chief of staff. The chief of staff leaked it? Yeah, he leaked it. He leaked it to the press. He exposed it. You can imagine he wasn't happy about it. I think this was after Ronald Reagan's presidency. I can imagine he wasn't happy about somebody else. You know, he's the chief of staff and there's another influence without uh, political credentials and qualifications. Although it must be said that, uh, you know, on job descriptions, you know, like job adverts, how it has like the desired and the essential list. Mm -hmm. Political experience doesn't even, to even seem to feature on the uh, desired <laughs> list when it comes to American presidents. Right. I mean, Ronald Reagan was an actor. Yeah. <laughs> and to be honest, that's probably the, why they were super sensitive about it, because he obviously had his supporters and his fans. He got voted in, but he also mm. had a lot of people who were critical about that. Yeah. And then, as we know, it was, uh, yeah, Trump, whatever, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. We yeah. need Spokesperson Marlon Fitzwater made light of the controversy as he opened his May the 4th press briefing and he joked, I'll take your first question at exactly 1233 and a half. 
media <laughs> crimes reported. Yeah. So they tried to make light of it and make a joke of it, but there was some seriousness to it that really, you know, comings and goings, taking offs and landings, they were really timed to the exact minute. At a photo op that day, Ronald fended off difficult questions and said, no policy or decision in my mind has ever been influenced by astrology. Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh, Ronald. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh Mm -hmm. He says no policy or decision in my mind has been influenced by astrology. That kind of softens the uh, statement a little bit to me. Isn't Ronald Reagan the one that had dementia and they were worried that he might have had dementia while he was actually in the office? Don't know. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease five years after he left the presidency, was actually suffering from it while he was in office. Yeah, I think that there were some suspicions that he wasn't of sound mind anyway. Mm. So the fact that he was an actor, the fact that his wife is consulting an astrologer, mm-hmm. and the fact that, yeah, it's it's a lot of fodder for his critics, right? Yeah. But that being said, the president's reputation didn't suffer, but Nancy would never truly recover from the situation. Of course, blame the woman. Exactly. That, that was my thoughts. Yeah. Men seem to emerge unscathed I mean, from scandals. She, she did hire the, the astrologer, <laughs> but... <laughs> but she shouldn't have been demonized for it, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. initially, she hired the, the medium. She hired Joan kind of to appease her anxieties, you know? I think it became her influence a little bit too much in the White House, but initially, it mm-hmm. was for that reason. If something provides you comfort, you will take yeah. it, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so, you know... Nancy said something very poignant that I think will resonate with a lot of people. So she said, each person has their own way of coping with trauma and grief. This helped me. Nobody was hurt by it except possibly me, she said in her memoir. So that made me sad. Maybe the Russians. (laughs) That that made me sort of sad for Nancy because she was, you know, her reputation was harmed. She got a, a lot of grief from using a medium. She did all this because she believed she was protecting her husband. And he has a lot of responsibility, too. He Mm -hmm. accepted that a psychic would influence his political decisions. So it shouldn't all fall on Nancy, you know? Apparently he didn't knowingly. Well, he didn't know at first, and then he did. So, I mean, what a dick to let his wife get all the flack for it, right? So that's the story of Nancy, Joan, and Ronald. And I thought it was interesting. I think I need to get Joan's book. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm interested to read it. Okay, so gear change now. We're going to move on to TV trickster Darren Brown. So Mm -hmm. Darren Brown, I've always enjoyed watching him on TV. I find him really charismatic and interesting. I remember years ago watching a show where he was disproving the work of psychics. Is he disproving the work of all psychics? I have to admit, I've never watched very much Darren Brown. Mm -hmm. Is he disproving the work of all psychics or is he exposing some of the tricks that like the fakes use? Okay, so he's exposing the tricks that they use, Mm -hmm. but I don't believe for a second that he believes that any of it's true. Right, okay. You could watch Darren Brown and completely believe in psychics, but watch Darren Brown to sort of pick up on how the fakes might Yeah, well, that's what I left with it. That's the effect it had on me, that I thought, okay, he hasn't proven to me that... There's no psychics, just that this is what some... Yeah, but he did very clearly and very well show the techniques that fake psychics can use and how it can really easily pull the wool over people's eyes. He made his television debut with Darren Brown, the Darren Brown Mind Control in 2000, and he has since produced several more shows for stage and TV. So he does not claim to possess any supernatural powers. In fact, his acts are often designed to expose the methods of those who do assert such claims, such as faith healers and mediums. He often begins live performances by stating that his results are achieved through magic, suggestion, psychology, misdirection, and showmanship. So in his book, Tricks of the Mind, he wrote, I am often dishonest in my techniques, but always honest about my dishonesty. I happily admit to cheating. It's all part of the game. Oh, he would make such a good president. (sighs) (laughs) Right? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that could have been a, a Trump quote. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Darren Brown is very convincing, very charismatic, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. speaks with a lot of conviction. Darren Brown states that he uses a variety of methods to achieve his illusions, including traditional magic and conjuring techniques, memory techniques, hypnosis, body language reading, cognitive psychology, cold reading, and psychological, subliminal, and ideomotor suggestions. So all of these things he says is, you know, techniques he used to trick people into thinking in one of his TV shows that he was a psychic. And I'll talk more about that in a sec. 
So concerning his apparent success at hypnotizing people, he stated that he can normally spot a suggestible type of person and chooses that person to be his participant. Oh, so that's interesting. So that's like saying not everyone is as suggestible to hypnosis. Darren makes no apologies for being skeptical when it comes to people who claim to be psychic. He once said, when you make an extraordinary claim that you're psychic or have supernatural powers, you have got to be able to back up your claim with proper evidence. Like he doesn't me. disbelieve in psychics. No, but like me, no, he does disbelieve them. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's my next sentence. <laughs> so he, like me, likes a little bit of scientific evidence. Darren thinks mediums are frauds and claims that the tricks they use to read people's minds aren't that clever and insists that they rely heavily on audiences volunteering information. And he makes a really strong case. It's more likely that if you watch a show that is going to convince you that psychics are fake. And I think it could easily convince people that think that it is true to realize that perhaps it isn't always. So in his show, Messiah, you can watch this on YouTube. It's a Darren Brown show originally shown in 2005. And in this episode, he travels to the U.S. to try to convince five influential figures that he has special abilities in their particular field of psychic powers. Mm. And he has successfully convinced the specialists the experts that he has powers. So the concept of the show is to highlight the power of suggestion regarding beliefs and people's abilities and their failure to question them. And this is something I'm going to talk about in a bit, potentially self-delusion. There's probably other words for it too, but I think we choose sometimes not to question certain things. Darren Brown makes it clear that if any of the subjects accused him of trickery, then he would immediately come clean about the whole thing. I would really, for anyone listening to this, whether you are for or against psychics, believe it or don't believe it, it is a really interesting show. So I would go on YouTube, type in Darren Brown Messiah and, and watch it. There's a really good just 10 minute clip. He uses a false name each time. He succeeds in convincing four alleged experts that he has superpowers. Darren explains that many mediums use a technique called cold reading. So during the seance that he conducted in his show, he convinced three women into believing that he was in contact with deceased loved ones. And during the performance, many tears were shed. Afterwards, it was explained to the participants that it was a trick and those appearing did actually agree to it being broadcast. Good on them because they're obviously like, all right, you can show my vulnerability and me being susceptible to being deceived mm-hmm. because I want I don't want other people to yeah. have, go through the same thing. Probably. But, yeah. <laughs> Darren's conclusion is that the belief system works in similar ways, that people tend to hear only the things that support their own ideas and ignore contradictory evidence. This principle is known in psychology as confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs or theories. I think, to be honest, in all aspects of life, we probably choose to ignore Political, certain things. Political, relationships, yeah. friendships, everything. Yeah. There's certain things, certain red flags, certain things that maybe don't make sense that we choose to sort of suppress that. Just, just focus on the stuff that proves what we already believe. Basically. Yeah. And if something comes along that disproves what we believe, we dismiss it. I think Darren Brown makes a really, really, really good, solid, strong case for psychics being frauds. He really does. Now, moving on to TV psychic Sally Morgan and psychic testing. Yeah. So Sally Morgan, she made a name for herself and made a lucrative business from the business of connecting people with their loved ones. I need to just Google an image of her. She was on TV a lot, wasn't she? Yeah, she was. She was a TV psychic for celebrities. She was on TV a lot. She was kind of moving away from this whole image of like Mystic Meg and that sort of thing. And and I think that Sally a- Morgan, a lot of people were into her and related to her because she kind of looks like somebody's mother. Do you know what I yeah. mean? She's just like somebody's harmless mother from a suburb. She didn't look like she was wearing a turban in a t- no. tent at a fair. She was she just like your everyday person, you know, yeah. not someone to be suspicious of. So I think that helped her. I think that helped her cause. Science author Simon Singh is a member of the Merseyside Skeptic Society, and that's a nonprofit organization that promotes scientific skepticism he challenged the claims of psychics. So Simon offered TV psychic Sally Morgan a fair test of her abilities, but she declined this. The test offered to Sally was based on asking her to reproduce the phenomena she produces in her show. But importantly, the scientists have invited her to discuss the test to see if she feels that any aspect of it should be changed. Sounds like a very fair offer, but she declined. She declined. 
To be honest, I might do that too. Cause I'd be like, fuck you. I don't, I don't have to answer to you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can see that. But I think really actually she would have done the whole world of psychics, a good deed to do the I test. I can see both sides. Cause I can yeah. see how oh, it would be amazing to get some of this scientifically. But on prepared. the other hand, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to hide. True. So be but then on the other hand, if you've got some men telling you we're going to test your, we're going to have to test your credentials, you'd be pissed off too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but at the same time, we kind of kind of want to be like, yeah, yeah. I'll show you then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know. I know. But yeah. So, the reason for Simon's skepticism is that Sally had been accused of receiving verbal cues through her earpiece while on stage because she had a stage show as well. So apparently an audience member heard phrases like Dave has a bad back being whispered from the lighting booth at the back of the auditorium only a few seconds before Sally repeated those exact words on stage. Hmm. What? Suspicious. And how did they even know that Dave had a bad back? Is there someone doing like social? Well, they thought that there were people in like the the lobby before the show, just eavesdropping. Yeah. People working for Sally. I mean, now it's so much easier to do stuff like that, isn't it? You would just have some fucking millennial in a booth, Facebook stalking the audience. You have all their details because they've ordered the tickets. Well, that's the other thing. Unfortunately, it's very easy. It's a very lazy argument and very easy to say, oh, all psychics are fake because they've got Google now. We've got social media now. They can look that up. So it's very hard for them to prove that what they're doing is legitimate. Sally, obviously, she denied the accusation, apparently saying that it was simply lighting technicians chatting. But that doesn't explain why they said something and then she immediately repeated it. Okay, Sally, tell it to the judge because I'm not 100% convinced by Sally. Darren Brown argues that if... A psychic were a doctor, and arguably mediums and psychics involve themselves with their clients in a similar personal and delicate way, you'd want to know that they had passed their medical exams. Yeah. Right? Same with our accountant, same with a dentist. You kind of want to know that they're legitimate, you know? What yeah. makes you legit? So Darren Brown believes that with a combination of charisma, a little bit of hot reading, and I'll get into that in a sec, some decent PR, you can have a world-class show. He believes that the main reason people would rather believe a psychic is genuine might be because the implications of it being a lie are so abhorrent that it's easier and preferable to give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, to think of any of these people taking money from people who are maybe aggrieved, had gone through trauma looking for answers, you know, that they're trying to trick them or swindle them. And and also people don't want to believe that you die and that's it. That's why religion is such a big deal because people want to know there's something after, whether it's you go up to heaven or whether that is you stay around as a ghost and hang out with your loved ones and your, your descendants. Yeah. We want to believe that you just die and that's the end. So I'm going to talk about some of the techniques that apparently fraudulent psychics use. Mm. And these are the things that Darren Brown has exposed. One of the techniques is called cold reading. So cold reading is a set of techniques used by mentalist psychics, fortune tellers, and mediums. So without prior knowledge, a seasoned cold reader can quickly obtain a great deal of information by analyzing all of the following. A person's body language, their age, clothing, gender, sexual orientation, religion, ethnicity, level of education, manner of speech, place of origin during a line of questioning. And it's true. You know, we can pick up so much from somebody. It's why they say, don't we make a decision about somebody in 30 seconds? Mm-hmm. You know, Less than that, I think it's seven seconds or something. Well, yeah, there's a lot you can tell. And I'm guessing these people are just extra intuitive. Mm-hmm. on these things so they see things that the normal person and again it's probably from practice as well yeah, as skill. very observant very intuitive they've obviously got people skills because they know how to talk to people in a way that yeah. convinces them for example glenn told me that our mother had problems with her fingers you know and she's got sort of arthritis type thing in her fingers and that she needs to look after herself the age that we are it's not that unlikely that someone who's the age of your parent would have arthritis issues and things like that. That's true, but it's also a very specific thing. You know, she they can make specifically a, her finger, which is something she has been going to the doctor specifically. And having physio for and all the rest. Yeah, we are in our 30s, the tail end of our 30s, which gives in our idea, 30s. And are still in our 30s, gives a good idea to him about how old our parents might be and what sort of medical conditions they may have. So yeah, it could have just been a lucky punt, but it was true. So cold reading commonly uses high probability guessing, like I just mentioned. 
quickly picking up on signals as to whether their guesses are in the right direction or not, then emphasizing and reinforcing chance connections and quickly moving on from incorrect guesses. So apparently fraudulent psychics would just, if they made an incorrect assessment, quickly just move on from that. (laughs) Psychologists believe that this appears to work because of something called the Forer effect and due to confirmation biases within people. So confirmation biases we talked about, the Forer effect I will talk about. Technique number two used by fake psychics, hot reading. In hot reading, the reader uses information about the person receiving the reading, for example, from background research, i.e. Google and social media, hot reading. This is something obviously psychics are accused of more nowadays than back in, you know, let's say the 60s when it was starting to become popular. And if you doubt how easy this is to do, just watch one episode of Catfish, where people who are trying to hide their true identity on social media it's very easy to find out their real identity, their real Mm -hmm. phone number, their real address, their real media accounts. And then once they've got their Facebook, then they've got their Instagram and blah, blah, blah. And then you've got- Everyone can be a detective. (laughs) Very easy to get a picture of somebody from Mm -hmm. Googling them. Technique number three is called shotgunning. So shotgunning is another commonly used cold reading technique. The cold reader slowly offers a huge quantity of very general information often to an entire audience, and observes their reactions and then narrows the scope. Yeah, I'm going to give you some examples of shotgunning. So shotgunning might include a series of vague statements such as, I see a heart problem with a father figure in your family. Okay, so obviously this sort of statement is problematic because there's a vast number of medical problems that have chest pain as symptoms. I even had chest pains a few years ago from picking up twins. Chest pain can be a common ailment. And And they're watching in the audience to see who's like starting to get emotion about that. Yeah. And then heart disease is also the leading cause of death worldwide. So to say heart problem, that can relate to a lot of people. Father figure can also refer to somebody's father, grandfather, uncle, cousin, or male relative who is also a parent or served in a parental role to the person. So that statement, I see a heart problem with a father figure. That is a very broad statement. Another example of something they may, say, they may say is, I sense an older male figure in your life who wants you to know that while you may have had disagreements, he still loved you. This is also problematic because nearly all people will have had such a person in their lives. Nearly all of them will have had a disagreement. I mean, how many people have you perhaps disagreed with? And then, you know, you may start to form stories and you're like, oh God, that's my grandfather. And yeah, oh, we disagreed about politics, you know? <laughs> So that statement is, again, so broad and really probably applies to so many people. Technique number four, the forer effect, relies in some part on the eagerness of people to fill in the details and make connections between what is said and some aspects of their own lives. And I know that I've done that. And people often search their entire life's history to find some connection or reinterpret the statements in different possible ways to make it fit or apply to themselves. Statements of this type might include... I sense you are sometimes insecure, especially with people you don't know very well. I Mm. mean, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm uncomfortable around people I don't know very well. You know, you have a box of old unsorted photographs in your house. Who does (laughs) it? You know, okay, people from our generation, because people don't really like to print them out anymore, do they? But like people our generation and older. Yeah. You had an accident when you were a child involving water. I mean. A witch kid didn't jump in the deep end of the pool and struggle. Yeah. I think you and I have matching scars on our chin <laughs> yeah. and matching chip tooth. So the, from the diving and from the wave pool at Brent- yeah. Brentford Fountain Life Center. So, I mean, didn't, we, kids- didn't we both chip our tooth in the same yeah, pool, we did. In the same corner? If you lived in Brentford Chiswick area and you went to Brentford, Brentford Fountain Life Center. Center, you will know that when the wave machine came on, the funnest part to sit in (laughs) was by the kiddie pool, which was divided by these pillars. But you will also know that the wave smacked you into those pillars (laughs) and both my sister and I on separate occasions chipped the same tooth (laughs) in that corner of the swimming pool. Oh my God, they were lethal. We need to go back and recreate that. It's still exactly as it was. It's still fun. (laughs) (laughs) So then another statement they may say is you're having problems with a friend or relative. Yeah. Now this is all the four effect, throwing out their very vague statements that people then connect the dots, try to make it fit somehow to their lives. So we talked about Nancy and Ronald and their psychic Joan. We talked about Sally Morgan and the fact that she may or may not be a little fraudulent. We talked about 
Darren Brown and the methods that he exposed that fake psychics used. So here are my conclusions or my final thoughts, like Jerry Springer's final thoughts. Remember yeah. mm-hmm. the, the famous TV philosopher? Yes. <laughs> <Jerry Springer. laughs> okay. So these are my final thoughts. I think we give off a lot without realizing. There was a really fascinating TV show called Lie to Me with Tim Roth, the actor Tim Roth. Oh, it was so good. Oh my God. And also The Mentalist. Oh yeah, I need to watch that. I and watch also that. on Amazon oh. Prime, a show called Psych, where a guy is just super intuitive and really quick. Um, and obviously it's it's a fiction, but you know, you get the idea. And so he pretends to be a psychic and works with the police as a police psychic. Oh. So Lie to Me, that's a TV series with Tim Roth, and he plays a body language expert, and he really shows you, it's it's not a documentary, <laughs> no. but, but it does show you a lot of the techniques that body language experts use to kind of pick up on signals that you're giving off. And most experts agree that 70 to 93% of all communication is nonverbal, that we give off so much information without speaking at all. So I think... My personal opinion, as people, we are gullible, we are vulnerable, we emit a lot without realizing. We also have a desire to believe and seek answers to the unknown, because sometimes not knowing the answers to things is harder to live with than convincing yourself to believe something that may or may not be true. We talked about our guy, Glenn, Glenn Miles. We can't speak highly enough of him. Glenn is lovely. He's kind. He's nurturing. You leave his session feeling very calm, comforted, reassured. You know, when you first told me you spoke to Glenn back in her psychic in November, I thought, why, God, why don't you speak to a psychic if you need answers? Mm -hmm. I had seen him quite a a bit before I spoke to you about it, because like I said, (laughs) our sessions are quite interrelated because we share family Mm. members. And I really wanted to talk to you about it, but I wanted to talk to you face to face alone about it because I wanted to tell you what he said that also related to you. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask your permission first. I wanted to see if you knew, if you wanted to know it. I wanted to, yeah. you know, be able to gauge your reaction when I told you and know whether I should stop or not. It wasn't something I wanted to send over text yeah, or to tell you with the twins distracting our attention and so forth. Yeah. All I can say is that for me, when I left my sessions with Glenn, it was like a better feeling than having a massage. Yeah. I was calm, reassured, comforted. And for me, these are, it's an amazing way to feel. I know that there's no way of me proving any of what he said as correct about his predictions, but I'm also very happy to have given, been given some reassurance. I'm happy to live with a belief that perhaps it might not be true, but I, it, I felt good hearing it. Many critics of psychics attribute psychic powers to intentional trickery or self-delusion. So the big question is, though, is self-delusion harmful or... Ooh. Or is it a very good coping mechanism for dealing with painful realities as shown by Nancy Reagan? Can I just say, though, I have general anxiety disorder. So that means my default state is Mm -hmm. quite highly anxious. I am very happy to admit that I take medicine for it. I have a chemical imbalance and there's medicine that I can take to help with that. So fucking take your meds and enjoy life. If you can't have your natural serotonin, store-bought is fine. It helps me greatly. I'm not saying it's right for everyone, but for me, that was appropriate. I also, at the same time, did a cognitive behavior therapy, which I recommend for just about everyone. And it is how to cope with different anxieties. And basically what it is, cognitive behavior therapy, is tricks and tips and tools Mm. on how to trick your mind into being less anxious. Okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah. One of the things that I took away from it, which is such a useful tool for me, you know, you can't stop the negative thoughts and the anxiety and the worries. You can't. What they recommended was imagining that you are standing at a train station and the negative thoughts are the trains that go past the train station but don't stop. So you acknowledge them, you're wary of them, you step back, but that is not your train and you just let it go past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you make the conscious decision not to get on that train. And then the positive thoughts are thoughts that you allow to stop at your train station and you get on and you enjoy the ride. So I'm sorry, but that is like a technique to trick your mind into being more positive. Yeah. So how is that different? Well, this is the thing. Can I just say that I've tweaked that analogy Mm -hmm. to suit me personally? And I imagine I'm at Yo Sushi. <laughs> and the negative thoughts are the plates that go past on the conveyor belt that I don't want. So I look at them, I acknowledge them, but I'm like, no. But they're not, not for you. 
<laughs> and then the, Not today, the happy thoughts, exactly. The happy thoughts are the ones that come around and I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> this is why I say is self-delusion harmful. You know, and I remember that grandmother in Palestine and everything that she went through being a Palestinian refugee. And I remember our dad saying that faith was what got her through it. Mm. You know, her faith, she was a devout Catholic, got her through it. And this is the conclusion I've come to, that self-delusion is not necessarily harmful. That if there's something you can believe in to make you happier, to make your existence better, to make life less difficult, that is better than the opposite. I guess where it gets into the bad territory is like in our last episode where your self-delusion is combined with grandiose ideas and narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. And And I don't know where the line with unhealthy, you know, where you draw the line. Some people may say that my theory of self-delusion not being harmful is unhealthy. That's the thing. I think we've raised more questions than we've answered. And I think that is the theme on this topic. I wouldn't be surprised if we just don't understand these things that could be eventually explained scientifically. Uh, Yeah, that's it. Maybe there is a scientific answer for why some people are more intuitive, why they see things. Same with religion, same with politics, same with Mm -hmm. all things. There's always going to be fakes and people taking advantage of other people, sadly. Just the fact that there are fakes to me doesn't tell me that there aren't real people. Yeah, that's true. I still don't know. (laughs) Yeah. We don't know, but we also know that what we were told in our sessions was so spot on and not accessible on the internet. If you are going to try it, you should go to someone like Glenn or someone recommended, someone that you know a close friend has gone to or something that you can get an idea of what their readings are like. And what I would say is whether you're on the fence, whether you believe in it, whether you don't, it's an experience. I would love to hear our listeners positive and negative experiences with psychics Mm -hmm. so please do get in touch especially if you go see glenn (laughs) those are those are my thoughts those are my thoughts well thank you for that so fascinating isn't it i think i'm gonna go book a session with glenn now (laughs) you know what i know i i would i could talk to him like weekly if i could talk to him weekly i would love that i would love that just have it it just feels like somebody i love how you go to see him too because i feel like it's sort of um like two for one because he tells you so much stuff about like obviously our family, our joint family members. So I get yeah. like the benefit of your sessions. Yeah. As well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that. Will you come back and be a guest on the show again? Oh, I'll come back. I think I should be your co-host. <laughs> I think I need a promotion. All right. Well, so you'll definitely be back because you are, be um, I have a long, I was going to say I have a long history of bullying you into doing things, but no, if anything, it was the opposite, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I can ask nicely and hopefully you'll come back. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Mwah. Like I said, we'd love to hear your experiences with psychics. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Dean. Bye. 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 Hey there. Thanks for being a loyal listener. Do you need a new website or want to boost your social media performance? Or do you hate podcast editing? You've tried optimizing your website and social media channels but you're still not getting the listeners, downloads, and engagement you want? We, the Safi sisters, love helping people with tasks that they hate. We know a thing or two about podcasts, websites, and social media, and we love working with other podcasters and business owners. So why not head over to SwitchbladeSistersSocialClub.com and go to our Work With Us section. We believe in collaboration over competition. A rising tide raises all ships. Bye!